רפאלי פלי, אז אהוור גסט פיקר פור דה בר אילן ויז'ן סמינר סיריאס, דוקטור אלי פלי, ארנד איז BSC in electrical engineering and MSC in biomedical engineering from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, he then received his OD degree from the New England College of Optometry. Dr. Pelly is a professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School and at the Mockley Scholar in Aging uh, Eye Research at Shepens Eye Research Institute, uh, uh, Mass Eye and Ear. Since uh, 83, he has been caring for visually impaired patients uh, as the director of the Vision Rehabilitation Service at the New England Medical Center Hospital. Dr. Pelly is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Optical Society of America, of Arvo Association, and several more societies. He, is, he was presented the uh, Glenn A. Fry Lecture Award, Award and the William Feinblum uh, Award by American Academy of Optometry and numerous other award lectures and received numerous prizes including the 2020 uh, Oberdorfer Award in Low Vision by the Arvo. Dr. Pelly's principal research interest are, uh, interests are image processing in relation to visual function and clinical psychophysics in low vision rehabilitation, image understanding and evaluation of display vision interaction. He also maintains an interest in oculomotor control and binocular vision. Dr. Pelly is a consultant to many companies in, ophthalm in ophthalmic uh, instrumentation and uh, head display uh, and hand mounted display. Uh, Dr. Pelly has published more than uh, 240 peer reviewed scientific paper, papers and uh, has been awarded 21 US patents. So I'm excited to invite uh, Eli Pelli to give his talk entitled Understanding the Invisibility of Scotoma's Novel Simulation. Eli, please. Thank you, Yossi, and shalom, and uh, Boker Tov from Boston. Uh, it is uh, nice to be back in my uh, uh, city of birth, Tel Aviv. Uh, uh, even though remotely, I would rather be there personally, and I'm hoping that uh, COVID permitted, I will be there in March to uh, have a long planned sabbatical at Barilan to teach. The truth is that I will come there only for the food. The other stuff is sort of secondary. Um, as I uh, uh, give these talks on Zoom, I feel like I'm talking to the walls, which is a, a common expression in Hebrew. And uh, uh, so I, I will ask questions from time to time, and if anybody has the spirit on them to answer, please unmute yourself and shout the answer. This is just to make it so I know somebody is still there and so that it becomes a little more interactive. So let's go on to this. These are the uh, disclosures, um, which, uh, you know, none of them are really pertinent, but it's in the uh, case of uh, being as careful as you can. So simulation of visual field loss have been major tool in trying to understand and explain the nature and impact of field loss. So these are examples of simulations of, from the Lion Club website. I think the Lions are a great organization, but they are not vision experts. So we can forgive them that all of these are wrong. Uh, so, uh, but the National Eye Institute, on the other hand, are supposed to be vision experts, and this is simulations from their website, and lo and behold, they look a lot like the Lions Club, and they are all, also all wrong and misleading. In fact, the only the diseases they properly represent is what I call the Photoshop disease. People think if they can draw something in Photoshop, then they can simulate vision. Uh, here are some other experts, the Singapore Eye Research Institute showing normal vision and then um, vision with AMD. It's typically shown like this as a, a black spot in the middle and beautiful vision 
around it. Um, and then there's one slightly different from uh, another eye institute and they show a blurry center and clear vision around it. Also very much wrong. Um, so uh, here's another one from Boston showing another simulation of macular uh, disease, the same as the others in the glaucoma. And the one that uh, the most bewildering to me is this strange representation of diabetic that was in all uh, of those that had it. Uh, I don't understand where it's coming from even. The others, I have some guesses. And one would say, can the patient perspective on this be wrong? Well, here's a book by a patient with macular degeneration called The Hole in My Vision. And the cover of the book suggests similar view with a gray rather than black in the spot in the middle and there everything nice around it. The problem is that nothing in the whole book cover to cover related to the cover image or is suggest suggestive of such view. So we'll come back to that and try to see where, where were these coming from? So the, this is really a, a, a central question for my talk. Why are the simulations wrong? So the first reason is that there's a misunderstanding of the nature of field loss. And the core of that is that it is difficult to illustrate lack of vision. How do you illustrate lack of vision? It is not seeing black. That's one thing that we've been known now for more than 200 years. So the second reason is confusing the field diagram, which we get from perimetry, clinical perimetry, with perception. Simulations try to represent perception and field diagram do not. Again, why, why are those? And so, there is a misunderstanding of normal and impaired function. Vision is a dynamic process in space variable domain. It is difficult to illustrate that with a static image. So some videos were generated, but they are generally not better. Uh, the field loss can come from many sources. If we just consider retina field loss, there could be photoreceptor loss, which may be an AMD, in RP, and there could be a ganglion cell loss in glaucoma, in optic atrophy, and uh, possibly in AMD uh, uh, discoform. So this raises a question that I hope to answer, although not in great detail. Uh, does the lesion location matter for the perception? So it, is the location changes? And yes, I will briefly discuss this today. So why are the simulations wrong? Mainly because of lack of attempts to verify the simulations. You can verify the simulation with patients with one diseased eye. You simulate the, the vision with that eye and show it to the other eye and ask him if that seems like what he sees with his diseased eye. There are possi other possible ways, but this is already one way. And uh, in most cases, such verification will reveal the fallacy of the simulations. Maybe that's why people don't do that. But occasionally they do. Here's a paper um, on vision uh, with glaucoma. 50 patients were shown images and said, you know, which one of these represent how they see. So the typical glaucoma, late stage glaucoma, 0% of the patients said that this represents their vision. The early glaucoma, which we've seen also in some of those simulations, zero percent. So we know we don't need statistics to determine that these things are not representative of how the patients see. Now, four percent responded to something that showed a blurred version rather than black version. I still claim that you don't need statistics to determine that all these simulations don't represent what patients see. Now, a quarter of them say that they see no issue. They're not aware of any problem. So that is interesting. And this will be a, a core idea that we'll discuss today. Now, 50% of them claim to have blurred parts here and there. This is not supposed to say that it's the same exactly these locations that are blurred, but they, 
the patients report that they have blurred part here and there. And, uh, and then the most interesting one is possibly this, missing parts. They say that they see clearly, but some parts are missing. And can anybody see a missing part? See, nobody's on okay. Yeah, um, at the end of the wall. Yes. Okay, so here is this window yeah. is missing. And here's this window is missing. So this is like the games we used to play as children with the magazines. They had this compare and uh, find the differences. But um, it's, it's quite surprising that they see this, uh, but this is done with Photoshop again, uh, just creating this illustration and but a whole quarter of the patients report that. Now, some, just to make emphasis how scotomas are invisible, some scotomas can be seen only under some conditions, whereas three conditions, for example, this white noise perimetry where, you know, <laughs> uh, you can see that this is from uh, some time ago where the television uh, or the, the monitor giving white noise and the uh, patient is tracing the scotoma on, on uh, the screen and we get this typical uh, nasal step glaucomatous. Um, now, note that we're missing the physiological scotoma that should have been here. And this has been verified in a number of studies later on that despite being able to see glaucoma uh, loss with this, the patients cannot see their, um, their blind spot with this. So go back to this book. This whole book is about seeing your invisible scotoma using tricks such as looking at TV noise or blinking. So the, the, the patient with this book that, that uh, wrote this book, uh, through out most of the book, he was 2020. So it's not what we call a blind spot or, or, or a scotoma with macular degeneration. In fact, the whole book is about being able to see the invisible scotoma. So um, again, wh wh where do we get this uh, drawing here? I don't know, the author is an ophthalmic artist. So I don't understand where the cover is coming from. Clearly he doesn't see that because he needs to blink his eye to see the outline of the scotoma or the lesion in his retina. He doesn't have a scotoma, he have a lesion on his retina. But it's important to realize that even somebody who's in the business, in an artist, can produce an image like this, representing what he really doesn't have. So continue with this, why is the simulation wrong? As I said, it is difficult to show lack of vision. And we only know that it's not seeing black. So um, I'll ask you, this is bitemporal amenopia, a simulation of that. And the question is, is that correct? So the two sides are illustrated as black. This is the typical thing. And here, a binasal amenopia. So another condition, uh, rare condition, but here are the visual field. And you can see how the transformation of the visual field into the simulation is what got us this. But this is really bad because this is produced by a company in the hemianopia business and they should know better. This is not a reasonable representation of binasal hemianopia. This is what a patient with binasal hemianopia would see because they have no binocular field loss. They see the temporal side of the right eye sees the temporal side and the left eye. And altogether, the visual field is complete. So this other representation is completely wrong. This is extremely rare condition, yet we need to understand it in order to get a, an idea of what is the visibility of um, scotoma. So here's another opportunity to use this re relatively rare condition by temporal hemianopia. So this is the uh, scheme of the eye and the visual field and the uh, nasal field or temporal retina for the right eye and uh, 
uh, symmetrically for the left eye coding. And if a patient has an injury or uh, something that uh, destroys the chiasm, then they only see with their nasal field or temporal retina that doesn't go through the chiasm. So this would be um, their field. Now, if they had esophoria before they got this injury, then they will also get, uh, uh, the esophoria will manifest as tropia because there's no overlapping uh, part of the retinas to have any uh, 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 corresponding point. So uh, here, here's what the fields then look. So for the right eye, the field is right up to the middle. And then the left eye, is, this is left isotropia, it's moving to the right. And you see that it's off the midline. So the binocular field is like this. There is a part in the middle that is missing. So if we simulate it the way we typically simulate scotoma, Paris will look like this, which to this patient, which will be disturbing. But in fact, this is how Paris would look to the patient with bitemporal hemianopia and isotropia. Now, if you carefully look, you may find some irregularities here, but they are very difficult to see. And why is it like this? Because you gotta realize that the visual direction along this line is straight ahead and the visual direction along this line is straight ahead. So they got to be perceived at one next to the other, there's no room. So the scotoma is invisible. And the point that I'm making is that here's an example of how you can have a scotoma that you could record in perimetry. You put a patient like this in a perimeter and you get this strip of scotoma, but it is invisible to the patient. Ellie, may I ask yes. you a question? Sure. I want to ask, I mean, I understand that this is the external uh, uh, field of view, but what happens, for example, if they stick out their hand and they move it from one side to the other in the middle, will they, I mean, what's going to happen to, will Hold they- Hold on a minute. Even, sorry? Hold on a minute. Ah, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So here is, you know, this was Paris. Now I'm taking a selfie in a Chinese hotel bathroom. Um, <laughs> What else would you do? So here with properly mounted mirror, this is what a patient with bitemporal amyanopia would see if they, if they didn't have a foria. Now, moving to the other mirror, they're slightly tilted. And as a result, there is a scotoma in the middle, optical scotoma. And you can get the answer to your question. You see my hand here? You see it here? Yeah. So the hand looks like a hand. And if I didn't make you compare, this might have looked normal. Now, if you move it as you suggested, it will shrink as it goes through the, the space, right? And, but yeah. overall, and, and look at the face. So this is what a patient with bitemporal limonopia and esophoria sees. So again, uh, if you add movement, which will start adding movement soon, things are more interesting. But this is the static situation. And we can create this by changing the uh, prism in front of the eyes and changing the amount of tropia. And, and they will report that, that the person in front of them is shrinking or expanding. So uh, these photos are depiction or uh, perception diagrams. So we're, we're talking now about device scotoma. This is scotoma created by a device. So the, there, there are field obscuration scotoma that are visible. This is my favorite one. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, this guy has a scotoma from the phone. The Chinese have a solution for this, as you can see here. They have a lane just for the people who are using the cell phone to avoid problems. Now, this may be uh, amazing to you, but it's a joke. The Chinese do have a sense of humor and the whole setup here was created as a joke. 
Uh, spectacle frame obscuration scotoma is another one. Here we have uh, uh, a monocular visual field, which clearly shows the spectacle frame. It's visible. What is the impact in binocular vision? Well, it's much reduced as all of you that wear glasses, even with thick frames know. Um, another point while we read it, not this circular edge of the map, what's happened outside? This suggests that there's good vision outside, but obviously it's not. So even that circular edge of the perimetry is misleading people in how they perceive this. So we'll talk about optical scotoma that are not obscuration scotoma. Those are invisible. And I present them to you because they illustrate how invisible scotoma may look and the tilted mirrors in the bathroom were an uh, optical scotoma. The jack in the box uh, uh, scotoma is another example. It is a ring scotoma that surrounds high plus lenses. Uh, historically, these were applied to correct a fecchia or after removal of cataract. And in addition, there is the epical prism scotoma that I developed. So here is a visual field taken with a plus 10 lens in front of the eye. And you can easily see the scotoma. Now, how does that look to the patient? This is a photo taken through the same lens. There's no scotoma visible, but so it is invisible. But if you look carefully, you can easily see that pieces are missing in that image. There's a ring of content that is missing. And this is how you can have an invisible scotoma and yet a scotoma. So for the clinicians in the audience, these are Humphrey visual field diagrams from glaucoma patient. And I would ask how many of these patients likely drove to your office where they got those fields? Anybody want to volunteer? Them. Say again? All of them? Yes, all of them is the correct answer. <laughs> so this is a, a Humphrey again in the Gla a Goldman field and just to see what is the difference. So this is the, in this study, we measure the Goldman and the check marks are where the patients could see and the circles are where they didn't see. And you can see that they don't correspond at all. The, all of those check marks, ex except this, which is the optic nerve scotoma. So no surprise that the patient didn't see there, same here. But all of these areas are visible in the Goldman. Um, so this may explain part of that reason. Now that you can see how many of those Humphreys fit into one Goldman and now uh, the rest of those, and you can see again that they were uh, this patient saw anything but the optic nerve scotoma and uh, a couple of things out. But this difference will tell you why the use of these diagrams to think about it is very wrong, and why all of these patients were found to be safe to drive. Not only that they would drive to your office, but they were found in a study that we carried out to be safe to drive. Um, so how is that possible? Well, and uh, one point that I did point, show you there is that there is binocular scotoma. Uh, it has to be in both eyes to become a real scotoma. So uh, when we measure it on the perimeter, it's at one distance, but the scotomas uh, should be overlapping in space where there's a volume. So in, in the distance of fixation, there may be an effect, but there's effect of convergence and at other distances in 3D space. There is a different phenomena. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss this, but there's a paper and all the yellow highlighted references are on my website and available to download. So you can read the paper. So moving on on this binocular peripheral field loss, which is an important aspect, uh, let's say in RP, we have here 70 degrees residual in the left eye 
and 70 degrees residual in the right eye. What is the visual field binocular? Well, it is 70 degrees. Now, it is funny to think that actually to drive across state lines in federal court in the US, uh, they require 70 degrees in the left eye and 70 degrees in the right eye, which gives you only 70 degrees both eyes. But to drive a regular car in most states, this will be insufficient. How is it possible? It's possible because somebody that set up the rules thought that if you get 70 degrees in the right eye, 70 degrees in the left eye, you get 140 in the left eye, in the both eyes. And you'd say, no, nah, yes. There's a paper from the British Journal of Ophthalmology studying driving performance in RP patients and specifying the visual field of 42 patients. Right eye 30 degrees, left eye 15, both eyes 45. 15, 10, 25. 105, 50, 155. And even included patient 41 at 70, 70, and 140. So this kind of an error could pass through the authors, reviewers, and editors, and readership of a very prestigious journal and still being cited all the way today as uh, evidence about driving with um, the blind spot. Anyway, uh, glaucoma, early field loss. These were actually the first two when I Google that um, glaucoma, early field loss. And, and uh, what is the binocular field loss for these two patients? There's no binocular field loss, right? This has a field loss below, and this one has field loss uh, on the right eye above. So there's no overlapping. So there's no binocular field loss. So one of the problem is not paying attention to this. It's not my invention. This is from a, a course online that one could find showing the view with the left eye, the view with the right eye, and saying, this is what you see with both eyes. Now, this is almost true. It's actually missing. These two, two little things where the optic nerve and scotoma of the right eye is overlapping with the nasal step of the left eye and vice versa. But these are really inconsequential. They're too small to be of any importance. So what if the both eye nasal steps are in the upper field? If we flip that, what will happen then? Well, there's mirror symmetry in this, and as a result, it reduces binocular overlapping. So it will be a lot less uh, problematic than it may be impressed. And here's a result from a study, again, on driving with glaucoma. And the interesting thing is comparing glaucoma patients to normal control, and we see that they have a statistically significant difference in the field in the worse eye and in the better eye. But when you do binocular, there is no difference between the two eyes. In fact, they, they perfectly perform with both eyes open. So one problem is this, but this is not the interesting problem. It's still worthwhile to think about this. This is the residual island in RP. So this uh, shows the residual island and it has also mirror symmetry, which is interesting to think about this mirror symmetry and where it comes from. We are foveocentric in our thinking, and we think that everything is around the fovea. But in fact, if you think about evolution or, or development, actually not evolution, then it's coming from the optic nerve head. And this is what causes uh, these asymmetries or symmetries, if you want. So what is the effect of this residual peripheral island? An anecdotal report is that the patient find them useful. They're reporting awareness when they are gone. So they're not really seeing them. They have some impact possibility. The lower residual detect tripping hazard maybe and lateral residual avoid collision with other pedestrian, which is a main complaint of these patients. So how effective are they in avoiding these pedestrians? So here's an example, monocular fields. And this is a pedestrian. Now in a study that analyzed the risk of colliding with another pedestrian, we found that the highest risk is for pedestrian at 45 degrees. So in this case, they, they will fall into the 
uh, blind part of the visual field. But if you put those together, you'll see that now both pedestrians are being detected because the other side comes in to reveal them. So it's sort of an interesting um, outcome and it emphasizes how the binocular field can be much better than the monocular field. But we're not always that lucky. So what if we have a glaucoma patient and he already lost one eye from a trauma or whatever, and he has this pericentral scotoma. What is the patient view with this pericentral scotoma? In binocular glaucoma or other post-retinal ganglion cell cause. So now I'm starting to distinguish where is the loss. So here is a similar kind of thing, post-RGC. This is homonymous paracentral scotomas from a paper uh, uh, by Safran et al. And they look at the scale here. This is 10 degrees. So these are very small scotomas, very small partial hemianopia. And this patient says that the left shoulder of a person facing him appear distinctly narrower than the other one. So this scotoma, small scotoma is on the right side. So when it's facing somebody, it falls on the left shoulder of the other person. This other patient, did not volunteer this observation, but when asked about it, enthusiastically confirmed that that's what he sees. So how does that look? Here's a scotoma of the first person superimposed on a, a view of a, a patient, uh, of a person facing you. And we used a technique called sim carving for content-aware image resizing. This was developed by two guys, graduates of my alma mater, the Technion. Uh, and it is now widely available. It probably is available in most uh, uh, graphic or, or uh, image processing systems that you use. So if you apply that, you can force it to go through the scotoma. And these are just a few of the seams that are made to go there. And they um, try to go to where there is less information, but we force them to go there. And so this is the result of the processing you can see that the left shoulder is shrunk. And additional thing to see is that there are local distortions as a result of this processing. Now, I'm not trying to say that the seam carving is what happens in the brain. It's only a way to illustrate it in, uh, in a simulation. But the distortions are sort of an artifact of the process itself, but they are reported by patients um, with such losses. So it's interesting to see what, what does that mean? So we call this scotoma carving and we claim that it's applicable for loss at RGC and higher neurons, such as the partial localized scotoma we just seen in glaucoma, optic neuropathy, and in disciform AMD for the non-clinician, disciform is the uh, a disease, uh, a form of the disease after the wet, and it causes scar through the whole retina. So uh, not only the photoreceptor are damaged, but the whole retina, including the ganglion cells. Eli, can I ask something? Say again? Yeah, please. Can I ask something? Please, please, go ahead. Yeah, so when you are showing these uh, images, it looks like there is no movement of the eye. We'll but get to we that. We all know that we'll, there we'll is... We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a couple of slides. Okay. So this is simulated vision with glaucoma this pericentral scotoma. Can you tell where the invisible scotomas are? Ain't easy, right? So this is the original image and now it becomes a lot easier. We're back to that compare the two picture, but this is the scotomas. So you can see that the window here is missing and part of this car is chopped away. This is the fixation point and some stuff is missing here. So today's typical simulation will be like this. This is what will show the patient and say, you should be seeing this. But I'm claiming and the patients say they see something like that, which means they see no difference really, or some good observer noticed the, the missing parts. How do they do notice this? Of course, with eye movement. 
without eye movement, they can notice that there's missing part. But the question is what happened under saccadic eye movement? Some objects are uncovered and others get covered. And I said that there are distortions and you may be able to see the distortions here. Uh, and those, as you change the distortion, will be perceived as movement. So here's the, after change of fixation. So now different part is being uh, masked and other parts are unmasked. And the changes should have been very apparent during the transition. One more time, look to the right slide image. Very clearly motion. So following transition, the image looks normal despite severe distortion, still different ones, but still severe. So the question is, will the eye movement reveal to the patient the distortion and changes in object visibility? This was the question just posed, right? And uh, I'll show you what it may be if we just do this flipping. So it's flipping between the two conditions. And yeah, not only do you can see the motion, but you do it a couple of times and you can see what is missing. So, so one would, based on this, one would expect that this will be very visible in patients with glaucoma, for example, would, would report such things, but they don't. So, uh, the patient do not report such movement. Well, why not? Um, actually, well, I showed you this. Why, why don't they report it? Say the again. The copy? Um, no, the efferent copy serves to stabilize the movement, which will see that the whole world is moving when we move our eyes, but it doesn't do anything for the localized uh, the toma or the, the, the motion. So there is saccadic blur or suppression. People believe in suppression. I don't, I believe there's only saccadic blur and it masks the transition and the motion and the distortion. So during the saccade, there is a blur like this and then the image after the, mo the movement. So these are two different, and you can see the movement which the, uh, efferent copy may help in stabilizing and maybe reduce even that perception, but you don't see these distortions that I showed you earlier. So another thing to consider is that in patients with glaucoma, these scotomas and distortions are at 15 degrees eccentricity, where the visual acuity is worse than 2800. So for you to get the idea, you'd have to have this image filling your whole screen of 24 inch and you should be at a close arm length to it. And then these two scotomas will fall and we'll show you that in a minute. But so it's, it's very far peripherally in terms of QD and detection scotoma. So now I'm gonna show you uh, these transitions between the two conditions, uh, but I'll, I'll have you follow the fixation target uh, to simulate saccadic eye movement. And I have the saccadic motion blur inserted between fixations. So try to follow the fixation targets that will be here. Right here, follow the fixation. So you do, you do notice the movement which the afferent copy would help with, but you really have great difficulty seeing the motion that we see uh, when, when we don't have the fixation. So this is one way of simulating the situation uh, of saccades. And here's another one, which I call the flip book simulations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with flip book, uh, which is one of the earliest uh, ways of creating motion uh, imagery, uh, movie, if you want. So here we have a visual field of very wide field of view, 110 degrees, still only about half of what the normal visual field is. And we have various fixations point, the, the yellow crosses, 
And if you fixate here, I'm gonna present to you just this part of on the screen, <clears throat> which will be 45 degrees, which will be possible to present on the screen. And as we move the fixation here, I'll present you this. So it'll be this image, followed by this image, followed by the corresponding images. So all you have to do is look at the fixation. You don't need to follow anything, just keep your fixation here, try to get close to the display so that it spans 45 degrees and, um, and see what it looks like. Can you see the distortions, the cuts, the visual field loss? Now, if you already not seen anything, you can look around now and you will see that there are dramatic cuts in the images that are completely invisible if you just look at the center. And the changes that are associated, that many of them are overlapping, are still not visible because of the uh, flip of the images is giving a blur effect similar to the saccades. So um, just uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I was wondering if the fixations are similar when you have the scotomas versus no scotomas. So for these patients, which are glaucoma patients, the, the fixation is fine. And in the next slide, we're moving to the case where the fixation is not fovea. But I, I want you to see just that there is a scotoma here that took a big part, a big chunk of this image in another one here, which if you carefully look, you may not see the scotoma, but you can see the distortions, which are not visible unless you look at them. If you look centrally, you don't see these distortions. So the local distortions that occur at 15 degrees eccentricity or thereabout are not visible. No wonder the patients don't see them. So here is the answer to your question. And I just want to assure the rest of the audience that I did not implant these questions that came just before the next slide. They just come naturally from the progression of things. So here's uh, evaluation of the simulation of central scotoma with AMD from the NEI website. And in this study, not too long ago, they uh, showed this image to patients, that exact image from the NEI website, and 76% of the patients clearly stated that the image did not represent their visual symptom. So once again, no need for any fancy statistics to know that this simulation is wrong. But it's fascinating to me to read the figure caption in the paper. It says, a patch of distortion of, or blackness in central vision surrounded by clear periphery. Is that what you see? I don't see clear periphery. I see blurry and distorted periphery. So how is it possible? Well, this is not by a patient. This is by authors looking at their own caption and writing it. How is it possible? Well, being old, I know that the early version of that on NEI website actually had what is described here. It had a, a black patch in clear surrounding version. So whoever wrote that is also old and seen the, or seen the older picture and it has it in his mind and it doesn't matter what is in front of him, he is describing what is in his mind. Okay, so here's a simulation of discoform scotoma with the carving. What do we see here? Well, first of all, there is no scotoma. There's no black spot at all. This is matching the patient description. It's also blurred image and more so peripherally. This is also what the patient is describing. There are actually major distortions centrally or near. The, uh, one would say metamorphopsia, but uh, they are barely noticeable either. They're there, they're, they're, they're quite 
dramatic, and you'll see in a second that they are dramatic. But when you look at it, it's not really that visible. So here's the original image, and I'll just bring you back. You'll see that there's a lot of distortions. So this is a 32 by 32 degree image in six degrees scotoma, which would be a common uh, macular disease scotoma. And, and, uh, and we get this effect. Now, for the dry AMD with central scotoma, only the photoreceptors are damaged. So the RDGC are intact. I don't have time today to explain how that distinction comes about, but I, I will show you that to whet your appetite and say that if this is the scotoma, so there's none of this image is available to the RGCs because, so to speak, because the photoreceptors here are dead. But this is what the patient, according to our simulation that we call the scotoma replacement, which are the simulation for loss of um, photoreceptors is showing. So it sort of looks like filling in, but it's really, really different than filling in. First and foremost, it's, it's in the retina. There's no cortex required. And the important issues are the invisible scotoma. There are actually a lot less distortions, but they're there. And the distortions are neural in origin. There's no mechanical retinal distortions as postulated in many places when they talk about uh, uh, photomorphopsia. And, and uh, to compare, this is the same scotoma with discoform and with uh, dry AMD, and it, it's very different. Uh, so the location of the scotoma in terms of the new neurons that are affected matters. So to summarize, scotomas are not black. This is the one thing we certainly know. We can illustrate lack of vision. I've presented a few ways to illustrate lack of vision. The Humphrey field analyzer map do not represent loss of vision. They really do not. They represent loss of sensitivity. That's a different thing. Saccadic blur can effectively mask loss of objects and distortion. And this is something related to change blindness. Uh, my computer simulations of field loss are conceptual at this stage. They have not been verified yet or rejected. So they need to be tested, uh, but that come next. What is the relevance of all this? Well, there's great relevance. The invisibility of the scotoma may affect, for example, the poor compliance with medication for glaucoma. As it turns out, only 30% of patients continue after three months with what should be lifetime use of the medication. The patient simply easily realize that the simulations are incorrect and therefore reasonably conclude that they do not have the condition depicted or discussed. Better education using better simulations may improve adherence and may help in the treatment of this severe problem of treatment of glaucoma and other things. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I will really be happy. Okay. Thank you very much, Eli. So the session is open for uh, questions. Um, I have the first one. Eli, uh, can you say something about uh, plasticity? in terms of uh, changing the, the scotoma, filling in or other uh, kind of plasticity? So I, I am a, a very, uh, I don't believe in plasticity, but I believe that belief should be strict to religious places like churches or synagogues. So I think that the, this plasticity story, whether it exists or not, has not been demonstrated to be of magnitude and in, in size that is relevant for anything. You, we've seen um, crystal presentation uh, last time, I guess, and he's showing plasticity, but the magnitude of the effect, even if we take it to be happening, is inconsequential for the hemianopic patients, it's within the range of error measurement in visual field. Uh, and for these things that I'm showing here, 
the effects are strictly um, right now, but I can show if I had the time how they may make you think that you get plasticity if you look at it with that idea in mind. So some of the results that show, and I published some of these results on, on macular degeneration, for example, with fMRI. If you understand what happens in the scotoma replacement story that, that I have, then the fMRI will show what could be interpreted as plasticity. I think we have to be careful in you know, reporting what we measure and how we interpret this could be uh, different. So finding something that may be looked at or seen as plasticity is not necessarily a both, especially if one could show one argument that would result in that without plasticity. And that part of science has been completely thrown out that uh, now we have a good idea, we're gonna stick with it despite numerous uh, evidence contrary to it, where the classical thing is that the first thing that shows that it's wrong to throw that idea away and open us to look for a new one that, that will combine that with something better. But we tend to stick to the idea. So this is my two cents of plasticity. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you ever, does it, does somebody with the central scotoma yeah. ever show, have difficulties when they're looking at faces? Do they have any distortions at all? Uh, yes, they do have distortions. And, and the distortions they have are not really that much with faces. They do describe distortions of door jams, ceiling li lines. So when they look at architectural features that they know to be straight, they understand they have to be straight. They can even touch them <laughs> many times. And they, they say that when they, they look close to them, because when they look at them, they don't see them. But when they look close to them, they are distorted. And they describe it very clearly that way. Okay. Eli, I have, a, I have an idea. First of all, thank you for these details and very careful research and talk. But I think I have an idea why people describe it as black. In Hebrew, we say, we see an achlorim shachot by an eye. In English, it's kind of, we see black in our eyes. So maybe this is the well, solution. For the rest of the audience, we'll leave it out. But uh, that expression refers to the problem of describing it wrong, not to. Uh, I have a question uh, yes, about, uh, the previous one. Um, I'm wondering, it sounds almost like they have no problems in daily life. Like I wouldn't expect oh, them. Who, to, who, who, who like, have no problems in daily life? The scotoma. With the scotoma, it sounds like if they are moving freely, say in the kitchen. No, 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 no. We have to be specific. The macular disease patients have a lot of problems. No, I meant Because the everything is blurry. So okay. you're talking about the glaucoma. The scotoma, yeah, yes. The glaucoma. The glaucoma patients have field loss at 15 degrees eccentricity at the beginning, and they don't have problems. It's the big problem in treating them that they don't recognize that they have problems. And when we show them these pictures, they say, no, that's not what I see. Uh, this doctor is an idiot. This is not my disease. I'm not gonna use this, the, the uh, drops because and because they cost a lot of money and they hurt my eyes and they even reduced my vision. Yes. So they, they don't notice it. So it's a problem. Uh, they do have problems. They are not aware of their problems. Why aren't they aware of their problems? Because the incident, the, the probability of having an occurrence that happens because of that is not high. And you're gonna tell me you never a bump into the jam of the door? I know I do. In my field of view, I, I have many other problems, but my field of vision mm. is intact. Mm. And so, so we, when we have conditions that, that require instances to happen that are un, not common, 
then it's hard to know that. The macular generation is the opposite. You are always blurry. Sometimes you're distorted. Well, okay, but you're always blurry. And distorted blurry and, and blurry not distorted is not something that change your uh, functionality. If you can't read because it's blurry, and it's, by the way, it's not blurry, it's low resolution. It's not the same. Blur and low resolution and low contrast are distinct things that could be mixed, but they're not the same. So, so the answer is, you know, and patients with RP, for, for whom the, uh, the ring scotoma start not at 30, uh, 15 degrees, but at 30 degrees, they don't know about it at all until it gets very close. People are with tunnel vision are defined legally blind when their field of view, residual field is 20 degrees. That's about less than 5% of the retina, less than 5%, it's actually close to, to 3%. That's when they are defined as legally blind. But we know that, that we're giving him that because when it shrinks double to 10 degrees diameter, then they are having problems. So yes, uh, you know, I've had so far two patients with five degrees, which is about one degree, one percent of the retina driving to my clinic. Ellie, we have a question uh, from the chat. Um, yes. So it's from uh, Rijul Soans. Hello, thank you for the excellent talk. I have two questions. First one is, why is a Gaussian uh, blur not a good approximation because of the filling in effect? And the second one is, how do you, how do we represent things that are not perceptible? For example, behind or ahead, uh, mathematically speaking, not a number would be a good approximation, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so not a number is used in the processing of our uh, uh, scotoma replacement. We developed the map with not a number to address that. So yes, it, it is a tool within this um, uh, uh, capability. Uh, uh, we represent, so first of all, we gotta realize that we are facing invisible things all the time. We called it occlusion. We walk and one person occlude the other person and we either don't see it or see part of it and we have no problem with this. So having pieces occluded or invisible is a, a regular occurrence, not a rare occurrence. Even parts of the same object occluding other parts of the same object. So we are con continuously faced with this. And, uh, and so our, our, our brain and our uh, conscious and our perception is common, commonly used to this. So having these situations is not a problem. Uh, just like people say diplopia is a problem. Well, I see two dogs. I don't have any problem with that. You know, it, we have to see how we interpret what we're seeing. So, can you remind me what else was on that question, uh, the first part of it? The first part was, uh, um, why is Gaussian blur not a okay, yes, approximation? Yes. So, as I made a comment that the loss of vision in the periphery, which we all have, the patients with macular generation only have that, they don't have the fovea, but it's not a Gaussian blur. Why not? Because it's a loss of resolution, not a Gaussian blur. You know, I'm a student of electrical engineering. Electrical engineers use Gaussian for everything. That's because we have mathematical tools to handle Gaussian. And so, so whenever we need to do anything, we assume Gaussian in use what we have, but it's, it's a natural response. But the Gaussian blur is not the best for, in any sense, for representing a blur. A blur of an optical lens is not Gaussian. 
It has phase reversals and all kinds of other things. So um, lower contrast is one way and you can lower contrast in many ways and, and uh, Gaussian could be used, but it's not, it's not representing anything that we know is happening in the system. And in fact, so the idea of what is it is, is uh, I, I, just a recent paper made it clear to me that not mine, a recent paper that I don't, unfortunately don't remember the authors talked about metamers of a metamers, just like in color vision, we have two different stimuli that are looking the same because the metamers, they're indistinguishable. So we have done studies published, uh, available on the website in which we compare the view of an image processed to reduce the resolution in the periphery with the original side by side and we find the conditions under which they are indistinguishable. If they are indistinguishable, they are metamers, right? And that means that the low resolution thing is that. Now we've done studies in my lab with patients with um, macular generation, which we blurred the images with Gaussian. These patients are blurred, quote unquote, their, their vision is poor. They distinguish the blur, the Gaussian blur, nevertheless, they have slightly less sensitivity, but they do distinguish it. Furthermore, they even adapt to the Gaussian blur. So their visual system can adapt to the Gaussian blur and they can see it. So it can't be that it's a metaphor in any sense. Hi, uh, Dr. Pelly. Um, yes. I have a question. Um, first, first, thanks so much for the talk. It was great. Um, I, I just want to pick your brain because I thought the scene carving uh, method used to simulate um, vision loss was quite interesting. What do you think happens with um, hemanopia? Because in, in oh, the okay. cases you've shown scotomas, sure. they kind of drag in um, information I from around. I didn't plant this question either. Uh, so the, this project, this talk, is limited to discrete scotomas that are surrounded by vision. I didn't state that, but in the paper, it stated clearly. So it does ah. address the conditions of hemianopia, quadranopia, tunnel vision that completely extend. In fact, at the moment, I don't have a tool. You want to work with me, uh, Antonio? I, I, I'm looking. <laughs> I mean, for, uh, yeah. I'm I mean, I'm interested in trying to simulate hemianopia. Huh? <laughs> I'm interested in trying to simulate amenopia, so Absolutely. maybe, yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested in, I've been working on amenopia for 25 years. I, I'd i love to figure that out, and it's it's quite interesting. Um, it's fascinating that, you know, the loss of periphery, going to no seeing from periphery, is not a dramatic thing. You go from 22,000, Full resolution to nothing. It's a very mm -hmm. weak transition. But in hemianopia, it happens right in the middle, going from 2020 to nothing. And we don't see it. We, the patients, they don't see it. So uh, it is, and, and of course, the tunnel visions are also dramatic. The patients can have, as I said, 20 degrees residual, less than 5% of the full visual field and they don't see anything. They know when they bump into somebody with their sight, but they know they haven't seen it, but they don't see it. Mm -hmm. And so simulating um, these, these outside border conditions is on the path, but I still need to finish these two papers and maybe a oh. third one before I get to that. But I'm happy to talk if you have any ideas. Um. Well, um, yeah, we can talk, but uh, I don't think my ideas are anything groundbreaking. Um, I've been well, looking through papers. Think of it more. I, 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 groundbreaking a... ideas come from from breaking the ground. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for the answer. Anything okay. else? Hey, oh, yes. I just, Crystal, I have a quick 
addition to, to that comment, um, I would love it if you actually could collaborate uh, with the last, um, the last uh, participant who asked you about this. I couldn't say who that was um, on trying to, to model hemianopia. But in our experience, we have had a lot of patients with homonymous hemianopic field defects. Yeah. Um, who report filling in some of the same phenomena that you're reporting for scotomas, they actually report filling in of the scene. A um, huge amount of filling in. Yes, yeah, there is literature and, on that, and some of it is excellent. There's actually, uh, you know, particularly in looking at a face, somebody asked that about the macular generation, but there's literature about looking at a face and seeing uh, instead of after face seeing a full face, which is right. a filling in kind of thing. It's not really filling in. We have to watch to that language because filling in has never been demonstrated. The, fill the classical filling in of the uh, 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 blind spot has not been demonstrated or suggested to happen with natural looking images, only with brightness, color, and uh, static noise, and maybe dynamic noise, but not, uh, or, or uh, uh, repeatable patterns like gradings or things like that, but but not. It's explicitly said it doesn't happen with uh, natural image, but with, in hemianopia, it has been reported. It's controversial. It's arguable, but there are actually some old. I consider them outstanding papers because they were able to affect controls without any fancy equipment, but just with proper thinking. And uh, so there are some very good papers that show that there is phenomena of completion. It's not called filling in, it's called completion. There's a completion across the middle line. Now, just to disclose another future project is that the scotoma replacement aspect that, that we're using for the phonoreceptor also suggests that you, there should be some completion across the midline. And there are other things that suggest that. The phenomena of midline stereopsis cannot be explained without some kind of a, a completion on the other side. Uh, the typical diagram in engineering areas of a stereopsis is doing it on the midline. It doesn't work because the images go to two different hemispheres. So there's no binocular cells that could de detect the disparity. So the, the good uh, illustrations and diagrams in vision science are for an object to the right or to the left and at different distance, and those go to one hemisphere where there is this. But there is midline uh, stereopsis, no question about it, and it even exists in patients that had the accusation of the brain. So. Um, so something is happening there that we are not clear about. And, and I have ideas uh, that, that this, um, this uh, photoreceptor has to do with that. And so that there is a transition. It's, it's not an overlap in the sense that some people have suggested. It's simply the way the system works. So much of what we see it's not plasticity, it's just the way the system works. And it wasn't designed or evolved to deal with this condition. It's designed and evolved to deal with normal vision. These pathological conditions that occur in late age um, had no role in uh, evolution. Thanks, Ali. Okay. So we have a, a quick question uh, from the chat. From Iran, do you recommend a person with one AMD eye to look on a closed object with his two eyes instead of closing the AMD eye? Could it be better for him to train his brain for the binocular vision? Well, uh, so uh, the problem with th this problem is a clinical problem that comes quite a lot. The, it is a major problem when the AMD eye used to be the dominant eye. Eye dominance is highly spoken, but it's really, for most people, extremely mild. But for some people, like myself, uh, it, very strong dominance. 
in some of my patients. When they lose their dominant eye, they can't, the, 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 the eye with the macular degeneration interfere. And so one of my best treatment tool is a piece of tape to block the vision from that eye. So that, that is my uh, resolution for this. Um, the, I don't see a, a benefit on training and uh, forcing or, uh, you know, most of these people are old and I try to get them to function now, not to get them into the gym. Uh, since I'm not very good at that, I, I don't think they should be forced into the gym and I'm already old. Okay, thank you. All right. So if there are no further questions, let's all uh, unmute ourselves and thank you again, Eli, for the exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and good to uh, see all these friends here. Yeah. So thank you for coming. Uh, Sean, what do we have for next week? Uh, next week, we have uh, Professor Yuha Silvanto uh, that will talk about uh, insights from blind sight and the relationship to visual cortex to V1. Uh, I don't remember the specific title, the, the precise title, but it's going to be about insights about blind sight and V1. Bye bye. It was good to you. Thank bye. you very much, Eli, for the exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye.